Hey everybody and welcome back. Today we are going to break down the fights on the main card of the UFC fight night Reyes versus Prohoshka bout. And uh, great night of fights lined up, but first there's definitely some shit that we got to talk about. Like number one is all this weirdness going on with Diego Sanchez and his manager between the UFC and everything. So uh, all right, it kind of starts off with, you know, I see this tweet that gets posted where Joshua Fabia, well, first off, Diego Sanchez is in a room with all the UFC commentators, right? Like maybe Anik, I don't know. And uh, I know Paul Felder's there because he speaks up and he's kind of like, what the fuck are you talking about? But after Diego Sanchez is done talking and doing, answering questions with the commentators and everything, his manager, this Joshua Fabia guy steps in and starts basically telling the UFC commentary team how to do their job and that they need to do a better job of representing Diego when they're talking about him and that they're not giving him a fair shake and, all this stuff and Paul Felder goes, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about, man. So that's the first video I saw that got released. And then maybe I got the news in a different order, but soon after that, you find out that Diego Sanchez has been cut by the UFC and his planned bout against Cowboy Cerrone on May 8th is off, right? And he's cut from the roster, done. And you're like, all right, something had to have fucking happened here. And this Fabia guy, man, he keeps like releasing info as if it's going to be a good thing for Diego Sanchez. And it's not. It's it's just not. It looks terrible. This guy has like no... I mean, Michael Bisbing said he has no self-awareness. And he's 100% correct. This guy just seems like he has no idea what's going on. Right? So he releases a video that I think, in his mind, is going to make it all better. And flip the fans over to Diego's side and be like, oh, the UFC's fucking him over. Turns out, they have this phone call. It's like seven minutes long. And Sean Shelby the UFC matchmaker calls Joshua Fabia with Hunter Campbell, the head UFC lawyer on the line, right? And Hunter Campbell has a conversation with Fabia and he basically says, Hey, I'm getting a text message from someone in our medical staff or whatever that says that you came in looking for a complete and detailed medical record of like every single thing that's happened to Diego Sanchez over his career. And for us, that sets off a red flag because you're kind of indicating to us that maybe there's an issue that he has to get looked at and he needs to go in and, and there's some confusion and stuff. This guy, Fabia starts talking about how he has to meet some sort of deadlines, but the reason that he provided with the medical staff for wanting the paperwork or whatever was the long-term health effects on Diego Sanchez's career. You're, you're gonna, that's, that's the, if you're saying that the reason that you need the shit is to meet these deadlines because people are asking for stuff and you're preparing for Diego's career afterwards and you just want medical, why would you say to study the long-term health effects on it? That's going to make it sound like something is wrong with Diego, right? And then he's also sitting on there talking about how he's having problems with and rips and stuff and breaks in his hands and he's dealing with a hip problem currently, but at the same time he's saying Diego's okay to fight and Hunter Campbell's like, I'm going to need written confirmation from you. To tell me that everything is okay with Diego Sanchez. And if not, I mean, we're going to have to pull him and cut. Like, this is it. You know what I mean? If you're concerned about the... It was just such a foolish move on Joshua Fabia's end. And I think that he thought he was going to win the public over. And it was just so stupid. Like, if the reason that you're trying to gather that... In, first off, you're this guy's manager. You should know where to get this type of information from, right? And the guy just seems like he's floating through things cluelessly. Like... Hunter Campbell is like, you don't even get that from us. That's all kept with the commission. You have to go through someone there. So he fucked up in how he went about trying to get them. And he just made it. He cast Diego Sanchez in this like, and guys, just being honest, if you're the UFC brass, right? Like if you're the head decision makers there or whatever, and you're looking at Diego Sanchez, you know that Diego's a little bit weird, right? Like he's a little bit off. He's the season one tough now. He's doing all this weird fucking Yoda. I mean, he's he's just a yoga shit. He's a different dude, man. He's he's a little bit different. And there's nothing wrong with that. But when you get somebody like this who it seems like is taking advantage of him, I mean, damn, man, I don't know. You you got to be worried about Diego in this situation. And to me, on that phone call, it to me felt genuinely as if the UFC was just concerned for the health and well-being of Diego Sanchez. Diego Sanchez tweeted free at last. I don't know about that dog. You got to deal with this Fabia dude. You might be free when you get rid of this guy, right? It's just a shame because like Diego Sanchez is one of the like OGs in the sport and he is a legend and he does have a great reputation. He's given us some of the greatest moments in MMA history. I mean, just him walking out to the octagon screaming, yes, 
yes, over and over again, like shit like that. And then the barn burner that he gets into in the first round with Clay Guida, I mean, he's given us spectacular moments. And still a competent fighter went up and beat on Mickey Gall a little bit, you know? It's like, man, it's it's a shame to see that this Joshua Fabia guy is so clueless and navigating all these things on Diego's behalf and doing it incorrectly and just going about it wrong and thinking that it's right. It's, man, he just... You hope Diego is smart enough to say, okay, I need – this guy's the problem. This guy's when things started going wrong. I got to cut this guy out, man, or, like, have a serious conversation with him about the decision he's making because, goddamn, I mean, it's, it, it just seems so foolish to know that you, Diego's in the middle of camp preparing to fight Cowboy and you need to collect his medical records for some deadline that you have to meet, whatever, right? Why would the I, – I can't get over why he said we're studying the long-term health effects of Diego's career and then gets on the phone with the UFC's lawyer and goes, yeah, we're looking at a hip problem and a finger – or hip problems in his hands with rips and tears right now and stuff like that and just everything. Why? Why is that what you're saying when you're also trying to make a point to them that he's okay to fight? And then they post this and try to make it like look like the UFC's wronging them. And like, no, you're giving them all these fucking – all this conflicting information and setting off all these red flags. It's – very bizarre. But anyway, um, in other news, kind of a bummer on this one. Uh, two bummers, actually. First one is TJ Dillashaw is out of his planned bout against Corey Sandhagen. That was going to be, I believe, on May 8th on that same card. But he suffered a cut, I think, over his right eye that's going to pull him out of the fight. Hopefully they reschedule that. The Bantamweight position is just in such a weird spot right now because he got Aljamain Sterling holding on to the title. And he earned it through a disqualification when right Piotr Jan threw that illegal knee Aljamain couldn't continue he wins the belt by default and you know you know Jan was winning the fight so he deserves an immediate title rematch but then I think Aljamain maybe had something going on with his neck that he had fixed and it's like oh 135 is kind of stuck right now until those two sorted out and there aren't a lot of other options that Corey can take other than TJ, you know what I mean? And TJ's a pretty good money fight. So I think they're going to just give that cut time to heal up and maybe hopefully reschedule it for some time this summer. But uh, that's a bummer. That's a fight I was really looking forward to watching. Um, and, you know, those two used to train together as well. So a little bit of, you know, a little bit of that going on. Uh, oh, the other fight that's off is Rumble Johnson versus Yoel Romero. I guess Yoel Romero wasn't able to uh, pass his – he wasn't able to clear – his medical shit because of something going on with his eye. I thought it was, I can't, I can't remember exactly what it was, but that one's pulled off, which is a bummer, but they re they rescheduled Anthony Johnson against somebody. Uh, I'm on MMA junkie site right now. So let me see if I can pull it up. But you know, at first I thought it might be a bad idea for them to reschedule the Anthony Johnson fight just because like, what if something goes wrong and rumble loses and he, the sellability for Yoel versus rumble kind of goes down but then again on the other hand he's fighting jose augusto uh seven two and one in a quarter final tournament bout at bellator 258 may 7th so they're keeping the same date they found a replacement to step in for ul and uh this is a pretty good card man i mean on the main card you got Derek anderson versus michael venom page patricky frieri versus Peter Quayle, hope I'm pronouncing that right. Jose Augusto versus Anthony Johnson and one Archuleta versus Sergio Pettis for the Bantamweight title. Um, but anyway, this might end up being a good thing because if Anthony Johnson can go out there and get, especially if he can get a knockout win and do it in like spectacular fashion, that's going to give the public even more of a reason to want to watch the Johnson versus Romero fight. Cause they'll be like, Oh, Anthony Johnson, like you get evidence that he's still got it and that he's still got that knockout power. Right. So uh, that might not be an, that might not end up being such a bad thing. We'll have to see. But uh, I know there's some other shit going on that I'm not going to get to today. There's been a bunch of shit. The Diego Sanchez was the main shit that I wanted to hit on. That was just so bizarre. Uh, Jones and Ngannou are having back and forth on Twitter, but I don't know. I mean, we'll fucking see what goes on with all the uh, with all the contract stuff. You know, you, you know, John's going to want some money, and there's been some complications between him and Dana getting the fight done. So we'll see. I'm not taking any of that too seriously right now. Uh, oh, something kind of funny that did happen before we move on to breaking down this card is Dana White, uh, or he kind of criticized Sean Shelby about not breaking up and not being ready to step in when Jeremy Stevens shoved Dracker close, uh, or Dracar close, and uh, ended up knocking him out of the fight essentially he got injured and wasn't able to participate in the fight anymore and dana white said that sean shelby needed to do a better job well dana white's the guy out there when these 
guys are coming out for the faceoff, right? And Yanku Taleba grabs uh, Dustin Jacoby by the back of the neck right in front of Dana White. And he's like, I was just fucking ragging on Sean Shelby for this. And I was like, yeah, man, you were. How are you supposed to expect? If that's his role is to be like the security guard there, that's so bizarre. I mean, Sean Shelby, he can't weigh more than like, what, 150, 160 pounds? He's not a big guy. And you want him in there breaking up professional fighters? At least Dana's a big, you know what I mean? Like when he's standing next to those guys, He's not as big as them, but he's Dana White's a well-built dude. And look, I mean, he's, he wasn't able to break the shit up. So it's like, come on. <laughs> Just thought that was kind of funny. But um, let's move on to breaking this main card down because we got a good fight card coming up tonight. Uh, so the first, I, at first I thought it was going to be a fight between Pollyanna Botello and uh, Luana Carolina. But it looks like that got bumped down to the prelims and there's only five fights on the main card now. For that one, I was going to pick uh, Pollyanna. Uh, just because I feel like Botello had an advantage in that Carolina kind of fights a little bit upright, leaves her chin hanging in the air, and man, Botello throws with some serious power, and when she switches off, she has a great kick to the body, and I think that her forward pressure um, would have just given somebody who likes to stand upright a little bit of problems, right? But anyway, it looks like the first fight on the main card is going to be about between two Bantamweights, number 12 ranked Marab Davalishvili and number 13 ranked Cordy Sta- Cor- <laughs> Cody Stamen. Now, Marab is one of those guys who is just known for his gas tank, man. He's able to put it on you and he's just able to keep coming and coming and coming. And he just puts a ferocious pace on you that you can't keep up with. And he ends up breaking people in that way, right? The interesting part about this fight is that he's going up against a guy in Cody Stamen who has some wrestling experience. And usually, in order for Marab to win a fight, he has to be finding success in that department. It's not that he's an inadequate striker. He throws a lot of spinning stuff. He's knocked people out with it before. He does have power in his right hand. But he needs to, in my opinion, have his complete game going when he looks his best, right? And that that involves mixing in takedowns. And Cody Stamen on the other hand, is very good at wrestling and he's good at defending those takedowns and he's good in transitions and stuff too, right? It's not like he's just a good forward pressure offensive wrestler. He's pretty good at scrambles and stuff. So I think the question is going to be, is Marab going to be able to keep that pace up against a guy who's able to stuff some of those takedowns and maybe make the fight a little bit more one-dimensional? Because Cody Stamen's a guy who can box pretty well, right? I think Marab has a little bit... They've got two different styles, right? Like, Cody Stamen will kind of sit down on stuff, wait for you to come in, and he'll unload a little bit of power. Marab's always, like, moving, like, always moving his hands up and down and throwing these, like... I don't know if you want to even call him feints, but he's got, like, a kind of herky-jerky just, like forward pressure offensive style that he implements right and if he's not able to get the wrestling going i'm wondering if some combinations are going to open up for cody stamen this in my opinion is the hardest one of the hardest fights of the night to pick i think in my heart i think marab will win just because i think he's going to put a pace on cody stamen that cody just won't be able to keep up with and it won't be necessarily a case of like Cody not looking good or Cody not being able to find success. It'll just be a case of Marab just never stopping, right? Like never stopping coming forward and controlling the octagon and everything. On the flip side of this though, guys, Cody Stamen has fought Jimmy Rivera, right? Who's a, and he's a guy who was able to, I think, kind of shut Cody down because Jimmy Rivera was doing really well countering. Whereas I don't think Marab is much of a counter, right? So I think that when Marab's coming in with these things, I think that there are going to be openings there for Cody to land shots on him. It's not like Marab hasn't been hit before, right? I think the odds are kind of swayed in this one. Like, I think they should be leaning a little bit more. I mean, I think Marab should be the favorite, but he's a minus 250. I think Cody Stamen's worth a little bit of money tonight. I mean, I just think it's, like I said, I think Marab probably gets it done. I think he'll just keep a pace on Cody, and Cody won't be able to keep up with the volume. But Cody can also land. And if Cody starts taking control of the boxing exchanges and landing cleaner combos in the pocket when Marab comes into range and if he's able to stuff a couple takedowns and keep Marab from mixing things up, if he turns this into a one-dimensional fight and it takes place in the pocket, Cody Stamen has power in his hands and he's a good boxer. And he's really big for the weight class too, so there's a good possibility that he's going to be able to move Marab backwards a little bit in there, a little bit more than Marab is used to fighting some of these smaller guys, right? Um... 
I think Marab gets it done, but don't sleep on Cody Stamen and don't be surprised if he wins this fight. Don't be surprised if he, if Marab looks good early maybe and Cody starts stuffing t- some takedowns and he starts applying the pressure on Marab. I think Cody Stamen has a great chance to win this fight. I think the odds should be a little bit closer to even, um, but I, I'm going to take Marab by decision. Do think it's a really close fight though. Really, I, I don't think the odds are, are accurate on that one. Next, we have a middleweight bout between Sean Strickland and Christoph Jaco. And Sean Strickland, man, is one of those guys who, if you just like watch him fight, he doesn't really look like he should be as good as he is, right? He's got a kind of upright stance. He's kind of heavy on his feet. but he And he kind of like slides off and like punches with his shoulders and stuff, right? Like he kind of uses a lot of his upper body as the momentum to generate power behind his shots. The problem is, is that he's really fucking accurate and he actually, he's, his he's stri- his striking is pretty fucking clean. I think Jotko in this fight has a advantage in the variety of shots that he's able to throw. But I think the thing that's going to really hurt Christoph Jotko in this fight, guys, is that Jotko utilizes a lot of movement, and Strickland doesn't. He just kind of like follows you around. He's much more willing to, you know, like I said, he's a little more flat footed. He's much more willing to stand there and trade with you. So I think when Jotko enters into striking range, Strickland's going to be able to capitalize on that and. Talking about the movement of Jotko, I think as the fight starts to wear on, the slow kind of steady pace of Strickland will start to take over. And Jotko's, and you've seen some of Jotko's fight if you go back and watch him, guys. In the second and third round, he starts slowing down a little bit. And that's when Sean Strickland, I really think, will start picking it up and stringing his com- combinations together nicely and really finding home. I think Strickland gets Jotko out of here towards the end of the second, maybe in the third round. Um, I just think his boxing is going to be too much. And another thing about Sean Strickland, man, is he's a pretty good grappler as well. Got an underrated ground game. He prefers to stand up and bang, but he's he's a brown belt on the ground, man, and he's crafty down there as well. So it's like he, he's pretty competent anywhere this goes, and I think he's going to have an advantage in the striking department. I also just think when he lands, he's, his shots are going to have a little bit more significance, right, than Jot goes. So – you know, for Jocko, a good strategy in this fight might be to attack the legs, right, of Strickland because he does sit so heavy on things and he does kind of, you know, have a lot of his weight directly underneath him when he's throwing these punches and stuff. So if you, if you can kick the legs and kind of take some of the power out of that, it might start opening things up offensively for you and create some opportunities for you to go in there and start landing shots of your own, right? But I just think that as Jocko comes in for things, I really think Strickland is going to start stinging him with stuff and it's going to cause some problems for Jocko it's going to wear on him and just the consistent pace of Strickland will pay off in the second or third and I think he picks up the knockout win next is the fight that we were just talking about earlier the altercation that Dana White failed to stop between Jan Tukutaleba and Dustin Jacoby this is a light heavyweight bout this is a really interesting matchup because you know Young Kutaleba is one of those guys who is super aggressive, brings a lot of forward pressure, and he has serious power, and he's very fast and explosive, right? Whereas Jacoby's a guy, fights kind of sometimes with his hands a little bit low, more willing to dance around the outside and stuff. So for me, this fight kind of comes down to, is, du- is Dustin Jacoby going to be able to control and hold the range over the course of three rounds against a guy as dangerous as Young Kutaleba, right? Um. Uh, another thing to watch for in this one is that Jacoby, I think, will fight at a little bit more of a consistent pace throughout the fight and kind of pick his shots, whereas Yano, he's much more willing to come in with big explosive stuff and miss with it. And that kind of, those those big efforts can take a lot out of you as the fight starts to wear on, right? right? This is a really close fight, and like I said, an interesting matchup stylistically. I've, I've bounced back and forth on this one a lot. I think I'm going to go with Dustin Jacoby. I think, you know, I was going with Jan for a while. I just thought that maybe is, and this still could happen. I mean, this is a tough fight to pick. I just kind of think that Jacoby has a little bit of trouble with people when they, fuck, now that I'm saying it out loud again, here we go again, right? I'm switching my mind. I think Jacoby has a little bit of a problem when people really crowd and disrespect his space. And in MMA, the striking kind of comes from these different angles and Jacoby's from more of a kickboxing back. I mean, he's participated in MMA. He's familiar with the striking there, right? But you get these guys like Kutaleba who are explosive and very, they apply straightforward pressure at you. I think Jacoby is going to, he might struggle a little bit with that. And I think he might get caught with something from Kutaleba that's going to hurt him. 
man, I just have one of those feelings about this fight. Like it's going to be a good fight for Kutule, but just because he matches up style, it's like a favorable, favorable stylistic matchup because I think that Jacoby is going to have to fight a really good fight for three rounds. Whereas young Kutaleba is going to be able to go in there and kind of make things dirty and maybe implement some of his wrestling a little, cause he can wrestle too. Don't forget that he's got powerful. I just think that the power difference, he's going to, there's going to be a little bit of a speed difference. And just the fact that young Kutaleba isn't going to respect the space that Dustin Jacoby is trying to establish early in the fight kind of gives him an advantage. I think young Kutaleba might get Jacoby out of here early, but if he doesn't, Look for Jacoby to towards the end of the first round, maybe start finding his rhythm a little bit when Jan Kutaleba has kind of burned himself out some. Thrown some of those big shots. If he can get him missing with those big shots, I expect Jacoby to kind of start to take over in the second and maybe get a finish in the third round. Or uh, it could go to a decision, you know. I think if Jan Kutaleba wins, it'll likely be in the first round or round and a half. But I do think that as the fight wears on, Jacoby having that, he'll start figuring things out and picking up on patterns in the striking of Kutaleba. And, you know, be able to put it, put together a game plan to get him out of there or at least come out with a win and win the last two rounds. I think the hardest part for Jacoby is going to be surviving the kind of early onslaught that you're going to get from Kutaleba. But we'll see. I'm going with Eon, and I think he's going to get it done in the first round. I think he's going to come out hungry looking for a win, throwing big bombs. And I think that Jacoby, with his hands down low and the way he kind of stands there, I think Eon might he might catch him with something before he's able to successfully establish his range and get to a place where he's fighting relatively safety, right? I think that's going to take a little bit, and Kutaleba is going to capitalize on that early. All right, next is a really interesting fight, a featherweight matchup between Giga Chikache and Cub Swanson. I went. Th this is one of those ones, guys, where, you know, Cub Swanson keeps getting matched up against these up-and-comers, right? And he's kind of like, I don't know kind of slipping into that gatekeeper role a little bit as because he's losing some fight he went on a four fight losing skid and then he won his last two so starting to get back on track the problem is is he's he's running into giga chikache and i think that I, I love cub swanson man i really do but i think this is a tough fight for him just because the way that cub fights he fights naturally with his hands a little bit lower i mean you go back and watch him fight somebody like shane burgos who's a little more dangerous on the feet and he does hold him a little bit higher but the thing that Giga Chikache is really good at, one of the things that he's best at, in my opinion, is making you pay as you enter his space. And he's, kind of, he's, good, at, he's good at switching his stances, throwing kicks to the body. He has a lot of, he, he mixes things up with his kicks. And he kind of frustrates you, right? Because he's holding the distance well. And he frustrates you into kind of like lunging in and not having sound defense on your way in to try to attack him. And that's when he kind of like slides off and stings you with these fucking fast, lightning fast punches, right? So his whole game plan is kind of like he establishes the range. And as you start getting frustrated and trying to close that range more, you get a little bit more sloppy with your defense and he starts stinging you on the way in. He's really good at catching guys on the way in if they're not on top of their shit, right? Thing that makes me nervous about Cub is that Cub is one of those guys who kind of waits and picks his shots and then goes in and throws his attack, right? And it's it's tough because sometimes it works because he throws things from weird angles and he catches guys and he's he's not just throwing like one punch combinations. So he's stringing multiple strikes together into these combinations, right? And he catches guys with stuff. But I think the problem is is that when he starts lunging in on those things to start attacking, Giga's going to start connecting. And it's going to make it hard for Cub Swanson to implement any sort of game plan, right? And he's not going to be able to cover that distance. Because like I said, the thing that Cub's really good at is kind of like bouncing around his opponent, you know, finding the range and then sliding in and hitting the guy. I think that right, I think that Giga is going to be able to counter him on his way in and catch him with stuff. And it's going to keep Cub from wanting to do that. But that's how Cub finds his offense. That's how he fights. You know what I mean? So I think it's going to put him in a little bit of a hole. And then Giga's going to just be able to capitalize on that and keep wearing on him until he either outpoints him to get the decision win or gets a finish. I think this is a tough matchup for Cub Swanson. One thing that you do got to keep in mind here, though, is that Cub is a black belt, right? And that Cub is also just a veteran in the sport. He's had way more fights than Giga. Giga. And I think that 
uh, it is a fight too. Like it's not a kickboxing match, right? And there are things that Cub Swanson, veteran moves that he's going to be able to do in there that kind of turn this into more of a fight as opposed to a kickboxing match. One of those things and something that Cub Swanson's pretty good at, he's good at catching kicks and getting the takedown off the kick, right? If he's able to do that against a guy in Giga Tricatre who throws a lot of kicks, he might be able to put this fight on the ground and kind of take it out of the one element that Giga probably has an advantage in, right? On the striking on the feet. But I just think that like, uh, it's a little bit easier said than done to do that. You know what I mean? I think that, uh, I think that Giga is very fast. I think that he's going to have problems. Like I said, stopping the offense of Giga, and then he's going to get frustrated, come in start getting tagged with stuff. And then he's not going to be able to catch. I just think it's going to be a lot for Cub to handle on the feet this time around. And, uh, it's not like he can't get it done, but I think that he might want to put it up against the cage, try to catch some kicks and get this fight to the ground and get it off the feet because Giga's very talented there a lot faster, and I think he has a little bit more pop in his punches. I think Giga's going to get this one done, but if Cub wins, I think it's because he makes it a fight as opposed to a kickboxing match, right? And Cub can do that, man. He's a vet. He very well might. All right, and finally, we're on to the main event between Dominic Reyes and Yuri Prohashka. And... This is an interesting fight because Yuri Prohoshka is one of those guys who he's got an incredible record. He's been fighting over in companies and organizations like Rise and Right, uh, where he fought like CB Dalloway, I believe. And he's also coming off a knockout win over Vulcan Ozdemir. And he's got this kind of weird style where he kind of like crouches down and does a little bit of showmanship in the cage and stuff like that. It's just, it's a little bit different, right? And Dominic Reyes, on the other hand, is a guy who's young but has fought for the UFC title twice now, right? Once against John Jones, where he lost a decision, and once against Jan Blachowicz, where he won by knockout. So you've got a guy in Dominic Reyes who not only has fought in the UFC for a little bit longer, but he's also fought against like the UFC's top flight competition already, whereas Yuri Prohoshka is coming from an organization where he's just not going to have faced the level of competition that Dominic Reyes has. Vulcan Ozdemir is a good win, but Ozdemir was able to hurt him in that fight a couple times. I think that this matchup and the fact that it's five rounds kind of puts things in favor of Dominic Reyes just because he's been there, done that with the big spot, the big main event. He knows what it feels like to go five rounds if he has to. And I just don't know that Yuri does. And if he's knocked so many guys out in the first round that if he's not able to escape the first, if he's, or if this fight goes into the first, second, third rounds, is Yuri going to keep up as we start getting into rounds two, three, four, and five? I don't know. I think Reyes is going to have an advantage there. I think that Reyes is going to be able to manage his output a little better than Yuri, whereas maybe Yuri will be looking for some big strikes early on and not realizing how much of a toll that's going to have on him later in the fight. I like Dominic Reyes in that was this one for that reason. I like the level of competition that he's faced. And I, li- I just like the fact that this is Yuri's first five-round fight in the UFC in a main event. And I think that Reyes is going to have a better idea about just how he has to manage his output in order to be successful. I think you might see Yuri looking for some things that maybe aren't there or maybe getting a little bit too excited about finding some slight successes. And Reyes will just be smart and defensive enough to kind of wear on Yuri over the course of the fight. I think Dominic Reyes gets this done maybe in rounds three to four. I think it's going to have a tool on Prohoshka fighting in an event this big in five rounds for the first time and against a guy who's big and powerful like Reyes, right? So if you're not putting him away and he's still there, what does Yuri look like later into the fight, right? That's why I'm kind of surprised to see Dominic Reyes as a plus 112 underdog in this. It's kind of surprising. I think he's worth a bet here. And Yuri Prohoshka might be the real fucking deal. Yuri Prohoshka might go out there and sleep Dominic Reyes in the first round. And then we got to be like, okay, you know, I, I just think it's an unknown. And we've just seen a little bit more from Dominic Reyes at this level on this stage, right? And uh, yeah, that's my main reason for going with him in this one. So Anyway, I think that's going to wrap this one up. I'm going to hop off here before the fights get started. looks like I got a couple hours. I think they start in like two hours from now. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in. As always, enjoy the fights tonight, and I will catch you later. Bye-bye.